thing. And turn it over to Nasley. Good morning, SUNY Online Summit. My name is Nasley Kirkjian. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the SUNY System EIT Accessibility Officer and Coordinator of Disability and Non-Traditional Student Services at SUNY System Administration. Thank you so much for joining us this morning to kick off today's conference. Uh, as Alex shared before, if you're just logging in right now, uh, please feel free to share your name, pronoun, and where you're from, maybe a little bit about yourself so we can learn more about you. Uh, to make the most of our panel discussion today, we've created this brief presentation slide deck that includes a link to the panelist bios and additional uh, resources for your review. So I'm going to post that in the chat so you can peruse at your leisure. Just trying to get the chat out of my way now. Pardon me one second. Okay. So, uh, before we begin, a few acknowledgements. Uh, indigenous land, uh, while we are virtually gathered here today for this conference, it's important to acknowledge the ancestral and contemporary lands that our colleges and universities are located. We recognize the indigenous tribes that are past, present, and few future caretakers of this land. It is also still Black History Month. We also celebrate the incomparable contributions of Black and African American communities to enrich our multicultural society. And lastly, I'd like to further acknowledge our collective wisdom here as a SUNY system and of course, um, whoever other guests uh, from outside of the system that join us today, we acknowledge the access and resources of SUNY faculty and staff participating in this conference. And we know there's a wealth of knowledge in this room and we have much to learn from each other. Uh, before introducing the panelists, uh, our incredible panelists, I, I'd like to make note of the ways in which this session is inclusive and accessible to you. We are here for an hour and a half, so please feel free to take a break as needed, go to the bathroom, grab a snack, peruse the resources that we've shared. It, they're on the last slide of this presentation deck. Uh, don't feel pressured to keep your camera on. Um, honor yourself and others by including pronouns in your Zoom name. Uh, we have agreed as a group that we would only use what we understand to be the accessible features on Zoom. So on this call, we will limit interaction to the following features, audio and chat. And uh, if you need to equitably participate in this panel, uh, please be aware of the following Zoom resources, uh, the Zoom uh, screen reader, uh, shortcuts and, and other accessibility features. These links, you can click to them and, and navigate them as you wish. And as Nancy shared earlier, uh, this is being recorded. And so the captions uh, should generate a transcript for the recording. So hopefully when you have access to it, uh, you'll be able to view it at your own leisure. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. Actually, I'd like them to introduce themselves. I have their names here on the slides, but uh, Gabriella, if you could please uh, introduce yourself and then we can get into the question and answer session. Good morning and welcome to our session. I'm so happy to see lots of faces here. My name is Gabriella Vasta. I'm the coordinator of Access and Equity Services and the EIT Accessibility Officer at SUNY Delhi. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and welcome. I'm looking forward to sharing some wealth of knowledge with you all today. Thanks so much, Gabby. Gabby. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Rihanna Rogers, and I'm an associate professor of interdisciplinary studies at SUNY Empire State College. I also am an open SUNY fellow in academic innovation and have been for about seven years. Um, I do consulting work for the Department of Education as well in New York, Texas, and uh, Pennsylvania. So I'll be bringing some of that in. Welcome. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Rogers. Courtney? Hello, Courtney D. Allard here, uh, pronouns they, them. I am the coordinator of the Gender and Sexuality Resource Center and the Women's Resource Center at the University of Albany. I'm an assistant director for intercultural engagement in student affairs. Um, 
and I am excited to be here. I'm also a, a, an online and in-person-ish uh, instructor uh, adjunct in other locations. Thank you, Courtney. Ember? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ember Trano, I'm the coordinator of international academic programming at Herkimer County Community College. Um, so I help our international students uh, engage academically on campus and orient to the academic life at um, U.S. and the U.S. education system, um, and, a, and, an, and am an academic advisor for them. Um, like Courtney, I also try to continue teaching. Uh, my backgrounds are in Spanish and in TESOL, so when I can pick up an additional course as an adjunct, I like to either on campus um, or online. Excellent. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. You have such rich perspectives and contributions to our SUNY and wider communities. And so I'm very excited to get to learn more about your uh, insight as to the critical populations we serve every day. Um, and so this is uh, for the audience how this is going to go. I'm going to ask the panelists some questions and then uh, we'll sprinkle in some audience questions to participate in the chat. So don't worry, you'll get a chance to share uh, the great things that you know as well. And uh, we'll start with a question for all of you. I'll start with Gabby. Gabby, what are some environmental and attitudinal obstacles that students you engage with face in the online or hybrid learning environments? So um, the quick shift from in-person to online learning has posed many barriers for students with disabilities. Um, many students with the needs to use assistive technologies or other support services to access their course content or materials um, uh, struggle to keep up with assignments. Some struggle to maintain good, good academic standing, uh, especially in the spring semester. Students who are blind or have low vision struggle to access learning materials compatible with screen reading technologies. Um, students with cognitive impairments worked to quickly um, learn how to navigate the online learning environment, where to find resources and submit assignments, when assignments are due, shifting from the face-to-face -face or synchronous-based learning lecture uh, to asynchronous formats, um, or navigating multiple ways of communicating. These changes uh, were not only um, faced um, by those with diagnosed cognitive impairments, but for all students. Um, deaf and hard of hearing students faced videos with live lectures um, and no, with, with no, in, no or inaccurate um, captioning, um, ultimately causing them to fall behind in their coursework. Um, students with mental health concerns um, were battling exasperated health conditions due to environmental issues um, and also changes to the learning the learning formats. Uh, because the focus was to transition everything to a virtual format in such a short period of time, um, accessibility was and it continues to be an afterthought on many campuses. Although many campuses have been talking about digital accessibility for some time now, um, many instructors and administrators still see this as an option or as an accommodation for students with disabilities, or more so as an afterthought. Um, at the same time, we should be thinking of digital accessibility as important for all students. There are many aspects of digital accessibility that benefit all users. For example, Camp, uh, captioning can help the deaf and hard of hearing students, but it could also benefit the students who share a workspace or who are parents and have sleeping children, um, who are English language learners or who have um, who are, or who learn best by reading instead of listening. So some other strategies to address digital accessibility for all users um, might be to ensure that the, you use the built-in heading structure of a document. Uh, this will allow more straightforward navigation for all students, especially those who may be using assistive technologies to navigate uh, your course content or document. Um, higher education has predominantly operated under an accommodation first state of mind, where students have to prove their disability in order to receive the services and the supports that they need to be successful in college. If we shift our thinking from this medical-based model to the social context, we will equitably be able to serve all of our students. The need for accommodation will be minimal and there will be less after the fact adjustment to our pedagogy. 
we have to think about meeting our students where they are and not necessarily where we think that they should be. Well, that was a fantastic way to start this conference. Snaps for Gabby. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, Dr. Rogers, I'm, I'm gonna read the question again. What are some environmental and attitudinal obstacles that students you engage with face in the online and hybrid learning environments? Thank you for that question. And thank you, Gabby, for um, giving a wonderful transition into what I'm about to say. So in my introduction, uh, I mentioned to you that I have been consulting for the Department of Education. So I'm actually going to share my screen really fast because I want to show you a table that came from the Digital Summit. Just to let you know, I'm part of an ad hoc committee that is made up of senators in New York State, educators in New York State. And so I'm going to share this screen that came out of the data set from NYSED. And so this is showing K to 12. And again, just to kind of caveat this, it's subject to change. You see it's a preliminary report. The report will be finalized soon. But I want you to take a look at this data for our K to 12 students. And then I'm gonna transition this into higher ed. Note that blue says students provided devices by schools before and during closures of COVID. The green denotes students with a dedicated device provided by family or guardian. The uh, silver denotes students who do not have access to dedicated computing devices. And yellow denotes enrollment of schools that did not submit a survey to figure out from fall uh, 2019 all the way up through fall 2021. This is really critical data. Look how large that blue space is, that schools are providing the technology. My point right now, and I'm gonna stop sharing, is the digital divide is real. What has been highlighted right now from what we have seen in COVID is that we made assumptions, not only at the K to 12 level, but at the higher education level about people's access to technology. And by making those assumptions, we have excluded a large percentage of people in New York State. We have seen this at SUNY Empire State College, and I know we see this, we're in SUNY online right now, but one of the things I'm gonna pause and say is, how many people are not able to access this conference? Just think about that. How many individuals who could actually benefit what we're all talking about right now might not be able to come here because they might have one device at home that their children are having to use and they can't actually attend, that they may not have a device at home. And so this is actually part of the, the broader research that I do. I have a project called the Buffalo Project, which actually surveys students. And it's now been going on for 11 years. It goes beyond empire and it goes throughout the SUNY system in a variety of ways. But this kind of technological divide is one of the biggest hindrances that I have found. Now I'm gonna kind of caveat that with another piece. There's also that assumption piece about people's technological savviness. People make assumptions that because you're young, you're tech savvy, or because you're old, you're not tech savvy. So I'm just going to pause on that for a second. The person who taught me to be tech savvy is 72, right? 72 years old, more tech savvy still than I am. I have students who are 18 in my class who are digitally phobic. They do not like it. Gen Z is notorious for loving analog. You can see that in their you know, reviving of records. It's because they're so saturated with technology, they don't wanna be around it all the time. We as educators need to change the way that we're thinking about how we're interacting with students, how we're utilizing technology, and look at the data sets to truly understand who has access and not make assumptions. Thanks so much, Rihanna, for sharing those preliminary findings uh, from State Ed, right? Yes, okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, Courtney, would you, uh, would you like me to repeat the question? Sure, why not? I like the way you say attitudinal. Oh, okay. Uh, so what are some environmental and attitudinal barriers uh, that your students uh, face when uh, engaged in the online and hybrid learning environments? Love the way you say it too. Um, so some of the things that uh, so I'm just I'm just loving kind of what we're talking about here in general, and um, I do some anti-bullying work and in instruction in, in K through 12. So I I really felt that data. I'm like coming it's coming up with it for me in a lot of ways. Um, I also think I just wanted to say like we don't like Zoom also has a call in feature where you can listen in, which means we also have to talk about like accessibility of slides right, versus chat when people are listening in and like communicating what's in the chat verbally so that people listening in can, can hear that um, piece. Uh, and I've been working then to my own stuff with my students. But uh, I want to kind of mostly 
bring in the concept of our LGBTQ populations and their accessibility during this time, right? There's a there's a there's a twofold, and I think we're bringing that up is that some of the success, some of this technology allows people to be more present or present in the way that they want to show up, or um, not dealing with some of the social stressors of what I look like or how I'm fitting in uh, because I have a I can control that in some ways. Uh, or I don't have to have those conversations in the hallway, or I don't have to use a restroom in a public space. Some of those other social stressors are relieved. Um, but in the general, um, the general one-on-one -on -one stuff, the ways that we would connect with students, the ways that they would connect with each other and learn in those environments, the ways that teachers would identify a student struggling in some kind of way, those things have changed. So when we are very focused on productivity today online, we miss um, the opportunities to, to connect or provide accessible options for students because we're often the attitudinal piece of that is we're afraid that they're going to misuse um, that material. They're going to take advantage, right, of, if we give them more time, if we let them change their own name, you can notice that I changed my name to have pronouns in the middle because when you're on a page like this, you can't see the entire bracket. Um, so that's the only way you're going to see that to be reminded. So there are pieces like that that come up inside of us as uh, older educators, as people who are maybe traditionally historically analog, grew up with analog and are now in the digital framework and are worried about the accessibility of those pieces that I think um, embody that fear. We, we kind of transpose it over students and their access. So there are a lot of ways that we could address that, and we're going to talk about addressing it. But I think the there's some data that shows that um, that even professionals in this uh, environment have had the ability to feel as though because they're home the most and they don't have to navigate other people to transition in their own identity, uh, gender identities, non-binary identities, which I think is a powerful conversation about the social aspect of our lives and control. But our students are still uh, very burnt out in a lot of ways. And so they don't necessarily want to show up for social events where they would gain LGBT connections or additional support services in another virtual space uh, and that is a huge gap that we're still trying to figure out how to connect which is how do we engage how do we educate now in addition you know especially social programming um, given all those factors great thank you courtney ember from your perspective um, what are some of the barriers that uh, your students or the students that you work with face in in this remote teaching and learning or student support setting? Sure. Um, I guess the, the main thing would be assumptions. Um, and I think that you're hearing that echoed through all of our responses and challenging ourselves as professionals and educators to take the time to slow down and think about what assumptions are we making in our, in our educational spaces, in our classroom spaces, um, or student support services spaces and how those assumptions that we're making to help someone may actually not be helping them um, and find a way for us to help them a little bit better. So I think that's the first sort of environmental challenge or just attitudinal challenge that we face, but also our students are facing. Um, but I, and I think the other part of that is once we understand what those assumptions are, thinking how they apply to those social constructs. And it's not just technology, it's not just learning, it's, you know, all those little details that we might just be not necessarily intentionally ignoring, but not thinking about that are hindering a student's success. Um, and in COVID world, and I know we're gonna get to this more later, so I don't wanna get too many details, but as Gabby said, some of the choice for students to participate in these virtual spaces has been taken away. Um, and I think that for students with disabilities and international students, that has a, been a major shift where if they wanted to participate in higher ed in the United States, that was the only way they had to do it. Um, and normally that wouldn't be the space that they would find themselves successful. So thinking about, you know, do they have the technology they need? If they have the technology, do they have, are they physically in a space? You know, rural in the US exists rural abroad and the internet access might not be there. Um, or even if they're in an urban space, the pull on, on the internet data might be so intense that they're getting kicked off all the time. Um, and I think those are some of the things that we're 
surprising to us as professionals um, that we found to be barriers for ourselves, but barriers for students. And we had to pause and I think reevaluate how we were using some of this technology because those things kept popping up more than we expected. Ember, if all right with you, I'd like to skip ahead to the COVID question and sure. start with you and go backwards. So you raised some excellent points about our assumptions of, you know, students abroad and, you know, their access in person here or in their home countries. And so, you know, how, how do you work and how do your faculty work to meet the needs of, of these students, um, whether they're in person or remote at home? Um, so I think the biggest thing is starting for me in working with my international students and my non-native English speakers is to find out from the beginning what they need and do they have what they need. Um, and that does take time. And whether it be, you know, in my so student support services side where it's a large number of students or just even in my classes, you know, finding out what those students need to be successful or making sure they understand what they need. As simple as a textbook. Um, you know, a lot of times I've found that students just assumed that they would be able to get the book they needed through the tech through the bookstore. Um, and unfortunately, in COVID, you know, for students who are abroad, you even if there was time to ship it internationally, some spaces have stopped shipping internationally because of COVID safety. So to if their book was only available as a paper text. They either needed to change to a different course um, or needed to find that book elsewhere. And that was something I could try to assist them with. And, but even with the textbooks that were available online, um, for example, some of our popular textbook publishing companies, the billing formats, so the student had access to the site, but the billing forms on those websites are based on US standards. So they couldn't enter in a foreign address or a credit card a non-US based credit card to purchase the book that they needed for the course. So it's those little details that breaking it down um, that I think were really important to, to get to with students. Um, and then the other thing is time difference. You know, for in, when we're talking international, time difference is huge. Um, and if it's an asynchronous course, making sure that students understand what deadlines are um, and that everything is set up based on New York time. I mean, every email or communication that I send to a student, I specifically say if there's a time and a date, it's based on New York time. Um, because other, it's a very easy miscommunication that can cause a lot of issues for a student if you're not that specific. As I hear you speak, I can't help but think but all the, all the um, practices that you mentioned are so beneficial for other students as well. I mean, you didn't say it, but I heard open educational resources throughout, you know, your, your speaking and also providing very clear expectations in the syllabus and in the learning management system or whatever platforms you're using to effectively communicate to students what they need to do and when and how. Um, so, uh, Courtney, would you like to comment on, you know, in during this COVID era, what what have you done to or or what have you advised others to do to meet students in this remote environment? Yeah, so one of the things that happened when COVID was shutting down, right, was especially if we had on campus students that they were also kind of purposefully told to go home. Um, and so many campuses did, I think, struggle to try to find alternative accommodations for some students who don't have homes in the ways that we might think about, right? Foster care, um, you, right? Students coming from foster care, students who are international, students who um, can't easily travel across uh, country. I had some of my uh, queer and international students whose borders were completely shut. So they were still here, right? And finding those accommodations uh, made me think of that. Um, but one of the things in coming back and being present on campus, if they can at, at this point, is that students who have gone home who are LGBT who don't, who don't have inclusive environments or under administration political homes where their identities can't be talked about or they have to listen silently while their identity is specifically targeted by their family members. Um, those, those toxic situations really also affect the learning environment, right? Their ability to be present, their ability to, to quote unquote, survive that experience. Um, we're seeing a lot of other emotional, mental uh, issues in those, those areas. Meanwhile, if they come back to campus, 
um, if they're home or if they're come back to campus and they're taking classes that are supportive of their identities or um, are kind of almost things that you don't necessarily want your roommate to be hearing or your parent to be hearing, but you're trying to attend online class, right? You can put in headphones maybe, but you couldn't, you, you can't always speak back. You can't always say the things that you want to say to your, even though it looks like it's just me here, right? Talking to you or listening to you. I can't say the things that I want to say or question or challenge the things I want to question in, in a quote unquote classroom. So I think um, there are a lot of uh, excess issues uh, in communication for those populations and their voices are being uh, differently suppressed in a way that we we haven't you know I think we'll we'll see longer term but I was thinking about that a lot with the the family environments and the roommates um, and identifying populations with a uh, with uh, online environments but for my classes there my classes have always been um, kind of multiply accessible right so in my zoom I, I've put, I give the phone number so that people can call in uh, my, my resources are open access. My book is open access. It's also can be on video. It also can be audio. It also can be downloaded to your Kindle. It also can be shipped to you in a hard copy book if you really like it from Amazon for $23 or something. Um, so making those tiered access levels, communicating those tiered access levels, showcasing the tiered access levels, reaching out to students that we see disappear, right? Like in, in multiple formats, not just email or the Canvas message thinking they're getting this. Um, and they're just not, they, don't, they just don't care, so they're not responding. I think that there's like a, a triage of things that we can be doing. Um, one of the things I always ask all my students to do at the beginning of each course uh, is a small journal that says, tell me about who you are in this class and, and how you learn, like how I can be a partner in your learning. Because even if a student quote unquote has been connected to the Disability Resource Center and has a letter for me, um, that doesn't mean there are other students in my class that with with that knowledge that I could make sure that the information connects. Now I'm in smaller classes. I'm not in a room full of 200, but it's not a hard scan. If you know, they usually don't write too much. Uh, it's not a hard scan to get a gist of the kinds of things that people are looking for and make that universal design. So um, those are some of the ways that I, I try to overcome those things. I also model my pronouns in my syllabus. I model it uh, for the class. Um, because if there's one student in the room, the virtual room, the digital room, the other room, uh, that will see it and and be able to share themselves more or at least connect with me more than then that's the step that I have to take. Thank you, Courtney. Dr. Rogers, um, how, how would you like to respond with uh, how you've been in the teaching and learning environment and response with COVID? Yeah, so um, I would have to say, I, I like to call myself an anti-doctor doctor. And one of the reasons why I say that is because uh, I'm not very fond of being a sage on the stage. Um, I really enjoy being a partner in the process. And what that means is in my teaching philosophy, I have to humble myself to be able to know that I might know things, but there are my students know as much as I do, just in different areas. And so here's what I've learned. That approach has been really helpful during COVID because it's, you know, I already believe that you have to be humble to be a successful teacher. I really do. Um, but I also believe that you have to be empathetic. And so in COVID, people are going through things. And um, one of the things that I really stressed with some of my colleagues, I run a variety of programs, is to really acknowledge that life has changed for students. They're taking care of potentially kids, their spouses, you know, their significant others, they're juggling jobs, they may have lost jobs. All of these things are impacting mental health, their ability to be effective in the classroom, all of these variety of factors. Um, I, I, I just did an article with E Learning Inside where I talked about the blurring of the digital self and the actual self that has happened as a result of COVID, where you were able to divide your personal life away from work in ways that you can't do anymore. And it is something that we have to acknowledge is happening to our students. Our students you know, think about what's happened before. I remember that meme that went on where there was that guy on CNN and his kid stomped into the room and he was all trying to push the kid out of the way. And, you know, everybody's like, oh my goodness, it's so bad. Now it's normal. Like, think about that. That is normal behavior. But we didn't accept it before. Our culture didn't accept it before. We made it seem like having children was a bad thing. Having other people in our lives was a bad thing. We can't do that anymore. If we truly want to be accessible in education, we have to recognize that we are a piece of individuals larger pie. We are slowly a piece of it. We are not all of it. 
And that takes humility, right? It takes your ability to say, hey, great, my class is important, but you know what? It might be the 12th most important thing to my student, not the number one most important thing. And by having that humility to say that, it allows you to understand that maybe I don't need to have that hard deadline of Friday at five o'clock for an assignment while we're in COVID. Maybe I can let students tell me. I was literally in a conversation, not a joke right now, where a student was asking me, when is the due date for my assignment? And I said, when do you need it to be? That's literally what I just said. When do you need it to be? Like, what's going on in your life right now? Are you gonna be able to meet that deadline? I have outlined in the learn my, my syllabus, these are when I want things to do, but I tell my students, you can come to me and tell me if you need to modify that. Because my goal for you is not to fail you because things are happening in life. My goal is for you to learn the course material in the context of the life and where you are right now. So, I mean, it's really critical to really pay attention. And I would say, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's a program that I started in COVID uh, with some colleagues called SUNY Empire Connects that really talks about the holistic student rather than talking about the academic student and why that that's important to keep in mind. But I'm gonna flash sideways and I'm gonna say this to everybody who's watching this. The holistic self, even you is important right now. Imagine the burnout that faculty, staff, administrators are having. You can't ignore that either. It's impacting your work life. It's impacting your mental health. This also deals with inclusive practices. And this is part of it. You know, I, I, I wanna keep stressing that the holistic health of higher education requires us to look at all elements, not just pieces. We can't do that anymore. Amen, Dr. Rogers. I was just thinking as you were speaking, I don't even make deadlines sometimes. Like we all have things going on in our lives as well as do our students. So humility, flexibility, and compassion is absolutely key. And I hope that is not just a, a, just a phase and part of COVID. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Gabby, um, so again, COVID era, what have you done or what have you encouraged faculty to do uh, to respond to the accessibility needs of students with disabilities? Um, just to piggyback, piggyback on what everyone else has already said, I mean, in working with students with disabilities at SUNY Delhi, we really just try to meet the students where they are and what works best for them. Um, we understand that, a, 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 you know, we students have a lot to learn uh, when it comes to navigating this online environment. Some of them had a little bit of experience, you know, coming out of their senior year, and now some our incoming students for this next fall are going to have a little bit more experience learning in a remote environment. Um, but they do need additional support in that area, um, and we provide, you know, as part of. Uh, our office efforts at SUNY Delhi, we try to provide a lot of transition supports from high school to college. And understanding that I know that not all students are coming from high school, um, you know, just transition supports in general from wherever, whatever environment they're coming from to help them, um, you know, prepare and learn for this new college environment, providing, um, uh, you know, additional one on one sessions and group sessions. Um, to, you know, get them up to speed as to what's going to be expected of them in this environment. Um, I try to put myself in, in their shoes, right? Um, in my undergrad, I chose to go to a brick and mortar college. The first time that I was challenged with an online or hybrid course, I wanted to die. I mean, I didn't have to take any online or computer, very minimal computer-based courses in my, you know, in my high school, you know, ages. So, um, you know, there was minimal support at the college level. So I had to teach myself everything that I was doing in this online or hybrid environment. And as a non-traditional student, I worked very hard to, to make it work. Um, but I was also that annoying student who asked a million questions. <laughs> and our current generation of students do not have the same approach or most of them don't. For the most part, um, they have been given what they need, the resources that they need to be successful in the secondary environments. Um, and resourcefulness and self-advocacy tends to be limited among those skills. Um, and so we really try to, especially for those students with disabilities, try to help guide them to learn these skills that they're gonna be needing or that they need to be successful in these environments. Thanks, Gabby. And I didn't mean to laugh at you. I just, I just know you outside of this panel. So 
I, I hear each of you saying, we really need to ask the students what's best for them, you know, um, and it's very uh, both holistic and also individualized, right? And in, um, you know, what deadline works best for you? What format might be the best to submit this in? Um, uh, what do you need to be successful in this course? I just keep hearing a lot of these themes throughout your responses. Um, so I guess uh, I'd like to ask the audience now uh, a question and please feel free to uh, put your responses in the chat. Um, how do you as faculty or uh, administrators or student support staff, how do you include student voices to inform the design and delivery of your courses or programs? I, I, I know that could be a one word answer, it could be a three sentence answer, early semester feedback survey. Yes, absolutely, I can post the question in the chat. Thank you for asking me that. And uh, while, while you're sharing that, if any of the panelists would like to quickly respond, then I can read back some of the chat responses too. All right, I'll just read. Like Dr. Rogers, I have changed the concept of due dates to match whatever the student can do. Respect survey feedback from the students. One of my graduate professors asked us how we wanted the course to be structured before we started. I love that. Highly active discussion boards. Um, keep stressing that I'm here to help them succeed and help them understand that students co-create the community norms for our discussions. Nazil, can I get a, a give an example of another way too? Yes, um, of course. So what I've been doing inside of COVID is making alternative assignments. Um, I've been allowing students, especially if they have, I don't like midterms or finals. I'm very applied learning. I, I have to tell you, we could go on a whole diatribe about that, but students want to learn things so that they can get a job. Let's be honest. That's where we are in higher ed today. Um, so one of the things that I've done is that students have different skills and different learning styles. So like, I'll give you an example, my quote unquote final exam now, I give the option if students feel comfortable doing a final exam, they can do one. I give the option of if you want to do a practical project, you can do one. Your practical project can be a mock training about what you've learned. Your practical project can be proposed to me your field of study, write a paper in that field of study of yours and apply it. I open the door for three to four different options and they come back to me to tell me what they feel comfortable with. And then I also ask them, what other final exams are you doing? I actually ask, what are you doing? So that you can budget your time around doing your finals. That empowerment process, number one, is why I have very high enrolled courses because students know I care. Um, but two, this empowers them to feel like, okay, and they'll be honest with me, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do your assignment this week. Um, I'm working on something, my professor is really strict and I have a deadline, but because I know you've given me flexibility, can I do it next week? And I'm like, sure. I, I think that says a lot about you uh, as a professor and as a person. And I really hope that all of those listening are, are, are taking note of, of those practices because it, it just, uh, coming from the disability services background, it really uh, pains me that, you know, our students have to, you know, ask for alternative kind of assignments. And those are considered fundamental alterations in some kind of ways when really it's about demonstrating what you what you learned from the class, and that can be demonstrated in so many different ways, right? And and so many people are. I haven't been able to keep up with the chat, but I'm loving all of the uh, all the things echoing some of what Dr. Rogers shared, allowing students options and choices, a uh, variety of prompts for one assignment, so they can choose between like a research or a creative option. This is fantastic. Thank you all for sharing so much. Can I just jump in quick? Sorry. Yeah. yeah um, I think I, I do agree with, with um, what's being said right now and having students maybe have a choice in how they respond to a prompt. Um, I do that as well as in my courses, but I think also thinking about how we deliver the content is just as important. So if we're giving them 
the information a variety of a way, different ways is, is, is just as important as giving them the option to give it back to us in different ways. Um, and I know, especially now, that's something that I've thought, I mean, as a language instructor, that's always been something that I thought about, um, mixing up writing and, and spoken uh, text or audio tech um, information. But let's be honest, in COVID, we're all like tech fatigued. I mean, it, it, it is a thing. So having students, you know, some of my students prefer to sit and read the text. That's how they get the information. If they want that, that's fine. But I know a lot of my students are saying, you know what, Miss, I just sat and did, you know, four hours of virtual learning, staring at a screen. And now you want me to read a chapter in a book? Not going to happen. Um, so finding another way, whether it be an audio book or give them a podcast to listen to that gives them the same content in a way that they're going to be more comfortable absorbing that information, um, I think has been something that I've tried to be more cognizant about. And I think that that's something that would help all of our students, whether they're you know, non-native English speakers, um, students with disabilities, or just humans in general. <laughs> I mean, that's something that we can all benefit from. I'm going to jump on that because the... It's also an opportunity in how they respond to the assignment, right? So it doesn't have to be written 250 words. <laughs> you know, uh, it can be an, uh, an audio recording. It can be a video recording. Like some of our students, like for my final, uh, you know, uh, last semester, some of my students had not done any of the synthesis stuff, right? And they've done none of the papers. And I was like, like what do you need? Do you want to sit on Zoom with me and I'll ask you questions about the reading and you just tell me so I can know that you, you know, you can tell me the answer and I can know that you learn. I know you know this stuff. What can we do to connect? Um, and those are ways that we can, you know, quote, unquote, in, 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 in pre-COVID time, that would be above and beyond, right? You'd be getting like a, a the Chancellor's Award for <laughs> academic teaching. Today, it's, the, you know, it's just like, it's like a human connection in the reality of our, our lived experiences. But I think we also have to talk about the culture of punishment inside of academia, right? Like the culture of um, the way that you learn is that you get the bad grade, you get held back, you get pummeled with questions because you really don't know your stuff. I think anybody who has a doctorate in here can know that they're a little bit of little hazing in that process <laughs> to make it be a, a somewhat humbling, but also to be like, you know, you know your stuff and you need to stand on, on these levels. Um, and that, you know, that there's punishment and there's a measure of pleasure that we've kind of learned that other people have in punishing us. Like, you want to give me this bet, you want to fail me. Um, that then our students were like, we, you know, we, we passed that down generationally in academia and, and from the whole, from the world in a variety of, of aspects to our students. And so we're learning to hold ourselves more delicately in all of this. And we're learning how to hold them more delicately in all of this and teach them how to hold themselves because I can ask them, but that doesn't mean that they know what they need, right? So it's, it is also up to me to see the ways that the culture has been problematic and, and impervious for many students of different identities and to um, and to give more alternatives and then and find a hybrid for them in that particular kind of way to know that I'm a partner in the process. I have to specifically say that because they won't just assume that you're actually here. I always tell my students at the beginning of the semester, like you start with an A. <laughs> Right. It isn't something that you have to like work all the way up for. You're here, you're doing the work, you're connecting, et cetera. Right. Like you can maintain that. Um, but it doesn't, it, you don't have to build, you know, you don't have to fight your way up. And I'm not here to take it away from you. Right. Like, what do you want to do? How do you want to accomplish and how can I help you do that? But it isn't, it is not a, it is not um, what do you say, uh, supported by the departments or the administration. I am still not going to get the support and the things that I need to show up like that. So building building off of that, uh, you know, partner in the process, uh, I think this this goes well into our next question uh, for Dr. Rogers. And I, and I know you spoke to this a little bit earlier, but if you could share more uh, about your philosophy and work uh, regarding a participatory research and its importance to the student experience and faculty experience. Sure. So um, I mentioned earlier, I run a, a very large project called the Buffalo Project. Um, it originally originated on my campus, but now it goes across uh, the entire Empire State College campuses and our international programs. But basically, the tenets of this project are based on participatory action research and responsive design. And what that means is 
I collect data from my students, whether it be informal or formal data, and I build programming out of that, not based on kind of the structural hierarchy of, you know, an administrator saying this is what we should do because we know many of those programs fail. Um, I actually ask the students because I want to make sure that the programs are successful. And I regularly survey people. So like I'm in the middle of a survey of Buffalo Project 3.1, right? So 11 years later, we are still surveying questions and asking if things are successful. And I discontinue programs that are not. And I change things to map to what students are saying they want. So I'm just gonna give you one example of a program that I run. It's called Virtual Residencies. Virtual Residencies are the largest program at Empire State College. And basically what it does is it brings together undergraduate, graduate, and international students in a three-week micro-credential around a thematic topic. That thematic topic comes from student surveys. I don't choose what it is that students are gonna be learning. They tell me what they wanna learn and I pull together the experts to create that experience. So this semester we have three virtual residencies running. One is on anti-racism, one is on world religions, faith and spirituality, and one is on leadership in times of crisis. And these literally all came from students, what they wanted to learn based on what's happening right now. I had no idea, to be honest with you, last semester, what virtual residencies were going to be this semester until midway through the term. That's the responsive nature of the work that I do is I am constantly staying in contact with the student population to understand what they want and building programming that they want. That's the reason it's the most successful residency. It's because I'm listening. It's because I'm paying attention. And I think something kind of more broadly that I would hope everybody on this call understands, we really have to think about the ways that we've engaged in higher education. That whole sage on the stage is really of the past. We have to be active listeners to our students if we want to retain them. You know, I was saying this was when we were preparing for this panel, we know that in the next few years, micro-credentials are going to be the thing of the future. We know that people are going to want shorter spurts of learning because they need to get out and get jobs fast because they're, they don't have jobs right now. They need to be upskilled immediately to move forward. They don't have two to four years. They don't have six to eight years to get a degree to take care of their families. We have to be responsive in higher education to map to what they're telling us, to what we're seeing in society, if we truly want to be relevant. Otherwise, you're going to see more for-profit colleges emerge. You're going to see more trade schools emerge. You're going to see more competition emerge in these environments who are actually listening, who are hearing what the students want, and they're going to fill the spaces that we could be filling if we're listening. So that's my thoughts about that. Uh, I could tell you a whole bunch more. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. And Courtney, and since you also mentioned the partners in the process, you know, how 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 can you speak to that a bit more? You know, how do you um, how do you collaborate with your students or partner with your students in your virtual classroom? I think so. I've always been because um, I'm also in, in student affairs, so I also do collaborative learning with students outside of the classroom, right? Experiential learning in that way. Um, and I'll say a few things here, like I guess in part of my own um, experience and growing up as a queer person in, in upstate New York, my approach to life has always been kind of a collective approach, right? So like we're all here, uh, let's take care of each other. Let's, we all have strengths. How can we work those things together? And um, in my work in building a gender and sexuality resource center, it, because of the need, because students were, were failing out, because they were not thriving in their environments, um, I also built in a experiential learning uh, opportunity. So this allows students that are struggling in classrooms because they also have emotional stressors, life stressors, to take a course with me where they're, where they're getting credit for their volunteerism. And we can develop them in the ways that they want to learn about themselves because that information is often not in their academic classrooms. Um, or they can, they can practice a skill or a talent that they have for the community that they identify with and giving them a holistic feeling of involvement. And that kind of course academic outcome has had a disproportionate effect of having students graduate because they, uh, they are continuing because they want to hold on to this or they don't fall below the credit number that kicks them out or loses them financial aid. Um, those innovative-ish ways of meeting students in the ways that they need to learn that academia has specifically pushed out to the many points of this panel um, 
is one of the ways that I mean, I've been doing that for 10 years with our students. Um, we, we, create, we complete more than 2,600 hours of community service out of the center and, and self-actualizing community service, right? Where, where you're connecting all of those pieces of your life and learning and feeling like you're giving back and it's holistic and that helps you thrive in other areas because you're nurturing that point. It looks different in this environment and that's that's harder. But I think when we think more innovatively uh, about those pieces, we can, we can um, we can speak to the totality of that student. It doesn't just have to be uh, the academic rigor um, that maybe we're we're used to. But we have we have we have so much. Right? Like I came onto a campus that had so much, and I was like, look at all these things that we could be doing. Look at all these connections that we could be having. Um, but often we stay in our silos and we just stay with our head down, and we think nobody else is going to support us or understand. And and that's a huge um, huge thing to lift. Um, and I added some stuff about my courses in the in the chat as well. But I think I, I think I hit the point you were asking. Yeah. Well, you know, I actually I, I'm gonna ask a, a follow up question to that just because I know we're on the online faculty track, right? So a lot of what we're talking about today is teaching the virtual classroom, inclusive uh, practices to meet the diverse needs of all our students. But you raise, you know, I, I mean, we have some student affairs folks in the room. You don't just teach. It, there's a very strong co-curricular component to our students' identities and their belongingness to our uh, colleges and universities. So uh, if you don't mind you know, me putting a, a you on the spot, Courtney or Ember or Gabby, to just speak a little bit to how your um, student affairs, co-curricular programs, um, the services that you offer um, help students uh, self-actualize or um, just be more engaged with the campus community, which in turn then helps their learning in the classroom. I think from a variety of standpoints, right, faculty and staff are out there supporting their students in the classroom and they often don't have all the supports that they need, right? We didn't have one of the reasons why we're having this conversation is because we're all trying to collectively learn about um, all of the knowledge that's in this room. So I think uh, one of the ways in student affairs, I'm able to support my, my colleagues more because I'm doing less student interactions in person, I can support my colleagues more in making sure that their stuff is more accessible or inclusive or um, the, the small things that they can be doing to, to reach students in, in different ways. That's been very valuable for us because we are all a conduit, right? Like we can all connect each other and connect students to the services that they need. It's very different, um, but that was one of the things that becomes a little bit more accessible to me now that the, the everyday student, the huge programming, the, the go, 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 the center is usually filled. We have like 80 people coming in and out a day. I've got 26 interns running. Like that slowing of that allows me to find more of the pockets of people that need additional, um, we all need additional information and support in that way, for sure. Yeah, I think I think all of your offices have really been instrumental to helping faculty um, and other staff, uh, you know, create inclusive digital environment engagement environments. So I myself have also noticed, you know, we've provided so much more training about accessibility uh, to faculty and stuff. So uh, it's interesting how we we're serving students, still continuing to serve students primarily, but now also supporting faculty um, for themselves and their own teaching. Um, you kind of spoke to this, Courtney, uh, and I'll ask someone else. I'll, I'll stop bug bugging you about it. Um, what are some other strategies uh, y'all can share uh, to gain faculty buy-in to incorporate inclusive pedagogy? Um, I can share as as the coordinator for disability services. Um, you know, historically, it's difficult to um, get faculty buy-in to include accessibility in their pedagogy. Um, usually we're not the most popular staff member on campus, um, but I've tried to change that culture a little bit on my campus and take a more of a collaborative approach. Um, accessibility isn't just my job as the disability coordinator, but also a campus responsibility to ensure that we're providing inclusive environments for all students. Um, and accessibility has, has to be part of the conversation in every aspect of our college operation. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard for me to be that one person and that's why I really try to take that collaborative collaborative approach and and educate uh, a team of individuals um, on my campus to be 
um, you know, those those uh, champions in accessibility, I guess you would say. Um, I work with our online instructional design team to ensure, you know, communication about accessibility tools and professional development opportunities um, and make sure that they're widely distributed amongst flat faculty. Uh, I also assist faculty in locating small wins that will move the needle in the right direction. You know, um, sometimes those little things are better than not doing anything at all. Um, I also have provided several professional development options, either hosted by my office, by other SUNY colleagues, or free or inexpensive resources that I just come across that will demonstrate simple changes towards a more um, inclusive learning experience for our students. Um, as the EIT Accessibility Officer at SUNY Delhi, I'm also working to develop an accessibility program that will help shift our campus culture to also embrace inclusive, uh, proactive approaches in pedagogical design. Thank you so much, Gabby. Um, I just want to, you know, emphasize that I just uh, make comment to something shared in the chat about, you know, our time and 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 making the captions, uh, in and documents and things that we have are can be time consuming, and you know, there's so many uh, free or low cost tools that are built into a lot of the technologies we use now. And there's so many different strategies to you know, um, create transcripts for free, like I can voice speak into Google Docs and things like that. And, and, and sometimes uh, those things are ways to to be heavy lifts for uh, time saving. And one of the things as I'm the SUNY system EIT officer that I'm trying to emphasize in the work that I do is also shift the culture away from, you know, a compliance framework um, to, you know, an inclusive and accessible environment for all and the benefits that you mentioned before of how many others it also benefits and um, rather than viewing our students as liabilities or as burdens on our time and, and um, you know, what we have to do to make sure uh, that our classrooms are, um, you know, able to allow all to fully participate and engage in them. Um, Ember, would you like to uh, share some of what you've, uh, you know, shared with faculty or other staff about how to be, uh, how to get faculty buy-in to incorporate some of those best practices you shared? Um, sure. So I think for me, I truly believe that, you know, learning is a social construct. Um, education is a social construct, and therefore we have to be engaged. Um, that's the only way it, you know, that comes about. And I think that stressing that to my students, but also to my colleagues has been really important. And I think intuitively we all know we need to collaborate more. So taking the time to reach out to somebody to say, hey, you know what, can we collaborate in this? Or um, in my, I teach first year seminar and training my students up to be ad advocates for themselves and start this education process to, as a way to identify who they are going to be as a professional in the future, they're starting their profession now. And yes, we have to take these courses that might not be, you know, our interests or our, you know, area of expertise, but can you spin that course that as a language person, can I spin that math course in a way that it benefits my future profession and training students to take every that approach with every course that they take and advocating for themselves, maybe in a classroom where the instructor might have a very direct point to that course contact to say, you know what, this isn't really working for me, but I intend to work in this field. So maybe can I approach this content with this lens? Um, as long as the student's learning the information, I don't know that the pathway to that information is necessarily as important. So finding a way to create these collaborations where the student is taking maybe their area of expertise with one faculty to another in that course. Um, or from a student services perspective, you know, obviously I work in international ed. So con one thing I think we've seen a lot given the context of the world in which we're living is, and I hear this from my SUNY colleagues, is that their offices are getting phone calls and emails um, from faculty they maybe didn't hear from in the past or their administrators are asking them to be more involved in 
campus trainings um, and outreach or you know, disseminating information to their colleagues on how to work more with international students, maybe break down those barriers. Um, because the reality of it is the world that we live in, those barriers are coming down around us or they're being built up. And it's, if we're going to include those, continue including those students, how do we, you know, get rid of those barriers that might be being built up? Um, so I think it really comes down to collaborating and it comes down to creating a voice for everyone and making sure you take the time to give ev everybody a platform. Every, you know, everybody needs that time on the stage and that includes the students. Um, and for me, and you know, I start in my own classes is it's creating that community of learning. So every class as Dr. Rogers said is different. And you, know, you have to create that learning space that is a community of itself. Um, and it starts there. And if you can model that with your own students, and then hopefully that continues throughout the campus. Would anyone like to jump off of what Ember was saying? Yeah, I think one thing that that's really critical in any type of space, it doesn't matter if it's if it's remote, if it's blended, if it's hybrid, it's about the, the context you create. And that means that you have to plan in advance of your course. One of the issues that I see that people have had, um, especially with all the data work that I've done, is people were thrown into online without proper training. And I think it's a disservice that we don't have enough professional development around understanding learning styles, understanding diversity, equity, inclusion, understanding uh, you know various practices, and that they're not required. It's not just about having them, because we have them, but they should be required. They should be something that everybody is taking part in part in on a regular basis. Because really, effective teaching practices, you can only be an effective teacher if you're continuing to learn. Imagine if you get stagnant. I remember I had a professor who I was teaching, I mean, I was working with them and their textbooks were from the 1970s. And it was like, you know, 2002. And I said, what am I learning in your course? You're so outdated because literally you stopped learning when you got your doctorate, you stopped. And literally everything that I was trying to learn, I had to learn on my own because it literally was not relevant anymore. And so I would say part of being an effective person in, in education is everybody is a learner. Everyone is a learner. And then part two of that in talking about spaces, you know, I talk about this thing about, we talk about safe space a lot in, in environments, but really I think we need to be moving towards brave spaces. And what I mean is that a safe space is a place where people can listen and hear, but a brave space is where people are empowered to be able to advocate for themselves, just like Amber was saying a second ago. And what we all should be actively doing is working to create community spaces that move beyond that kind of entry level of understanding, but really progress us towards that brave space where somebody can feel confident to say, you know what, I think differently than X student, but here's my reason why I think that way. And it gives that space for growing across perspectives. That's, that's really what's going to help keep higher education relevant for students moving now and beyond. Thanks, Rihanna. I, I want to make note, it's like 10.03, so I want to include another audience question. And I, I'm actually going to modify my question a bit uh, based off what you just shared. So if everyone in the chat, uh, I just shared a question, how have you modified your courses or programs uh, to, uh, to meet the diverse needs of students to create a safe space or a brave space? Um, please feel free to share in the chat. And uh, Courtney or Gabby, any of you want to share what you've done uh, to create a brave space and, and meet students, please uh, feel free to while people are typing. I wanted to speak a little bit about um, some of the things. I love that you brought in the social construction of education as a sociologist. I appreciate that. Um, and I was also thinking of like when we're talking about uh, the social construction of education as to like there is a way of learning uh, we can tell who is smart this shows that you are smart because you got this grade or that you're capable of doing these things when also education has become an equation for a lot of our students that they they know how to hit the equation um they know how to show up for the test they know how to write the the paper um but they are not holistic learners or educators are not getting education in a in a holistic learning way 
we also, I, I'll talk to, to for myself. I also did not learn that way. I didn't learn holistically. I didn't learn with accessibility. I wasn't in classes that were modeling that for me. So as I become a teacher, what I create is what I have learned, what I have seen from socialization. Like I recreate what I have seen. And unless I constantly challenge that lens or it's challenged from my, my work environment in a healthy way, not just you need to, let me just pile all this on you again. Um, that's part of our, our dysfunction and how we recreate the failures for our, for our students coming up or how we recreate the barriers for the students who have always had barriers because we have never seen an inclusive classroom. We have never seen uh, an inclusive learning style. And so becoming that is not easy, right? And it will feel like quote unquote extra work in other ways. Uh, and we have to see that so that we can start doing something different. We have to teach that differently. I don't know, Nasli, if everybody um, prior to this session would have would have seen a, a land acknowledgement and an, an, an education acknowledgement, acknowledge a, her a heritage into the space, how that makes people feel welcome and present in some ways, makes other people say what is going on in others. But, uh, you know, to talk about specifically about the accessibility to create and identify people that you can contact if you have a question or you have a need um, or something is not accessible, like even to create the slide deck to provide any of the ways. I mean, you know, seeing that model means that we can imagine ourselves doing it. And if we can imagine ourselves doing it, then that is the first barrier in my mind uh, to, to starting that path. Thank you for sharing, Courtney. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna move to another question because I, I wanna get as many as we can and then open it up for people in the audience to ask questions as well. Um, Rihanna, what advice can you provide to other professors to create a culture of care and become student centric? I think that's a great question. And I think there's, it's really important for us to really develop intercultural competencies. I don't think we're at a space anymore where we can ignore that diversity of opinions are important. Um, I mean, even in the chat box right now, there, there's this discussion about people walking on eggshells, right? And the reason why we're walking on eggshells is because we've allowed uh, higher education to become a passive space, a space that has kind of run itself for years and years and years. And what COVID is forcing us to do is to challenge that passivity and to become active again. And the way in which we need to become active is recognizing in ourselves that we all still have things to learn. Even though I'm explaining all this stuff to you today, I can tell you I am regularly attending trainings almost on a you know bi-weekly, if not daily, this last two weeks, it's been daily because there have been so many relevant trainings that are coming out. And if you are wanting to be active and engaged, incorporating that information is important. Like I'm gonna give you this as an example. I am on so many panels, right? So I'm on a panel, I was on like four panels this week. I invite all my students. I invite them to be actively participating in the learning process. I invite them to be here and to comment on these things in my class, to give insights. And I actually share and modify my presentations to incorporate their voice because that is truly something important. And I've seen this in the chat box. Education is community. That's what it is. We are a community of scholars. We talk about joining the academic conversation, but I think we've lost sight of the fact that the academic conversation involves every single person in this process. From the person who, you know, uh, people used to joke when I was in an in-person professor, like some of my best friends were the maintenance people. They were at all my talks, right? They are part of this process. Guess what? Maintenance is talking to students. Maintenance is engaging with students in the hallway. If they aren't educated and you're only limiting that to the professors, the support staff, then guess what? They could make the process negative. You could lose students because your community is not well informed. And I think we need to re-envision what community means. I think we need to re-envision what community means online. So even in this digital space, we need to re-envision our educational technologists. We need to re-envision our instructional designers and their involvement with the student population. They're building the backbone of what we're doing right now. They should be celebrated. So any of you out there that are doing that hard work right now, you should be celebrated. You should be acknowledged. You should be talked about in classes so that students understand the infrastructure that is behind the professoriate. 
Um, someone asked earlier, and then this will be my last point. You know, how do you how do you deal with students sometimes right now when when they're not engaging in your class? Rely on your community. Rely on all the people in your network. You don't want to do it alone. Don't do it alone. If you do it alone, it's going to be exhausting. But if you continue to think about student services, you know, all the supports that are there, it'll it'll be like a village, right? You'll be able to work together. So many excellent points, Dr. Rogers. Thank you so much for, for sharing. I, you know, bridging off of that, I, I, I really wanted to ask Ember, you know, how, you know, we can continue to take ourselves out of the U.S. context to better serve our communities. Um, and, and the international student body? Sure, um, I think it really goes back to that building your community as in who you're with at any given time, but then also asking those in that community to bring in their outside contacts as well into that space um, and share that with, with you know, those in that, that mo in that moment, I should say. Um, because that's the only way, and I don't want to, I know the question was posed in the US context, but I think it really, like Dr. Rogers just said, and as Courtney and Gabriella have said, we have to reimagine what our community is in higher ed. And I think that whether it's US context or you know New York context or online versus in the classroom, um, and I've seen this in the chat as well, best educational practices are best educational practices. And I think we, changing that our view on having them be in specific spaces is going to be our best resource um, and our best way to move forward. And I, I think for me, it comes down to getting folks engaged more than anything. And that includes the students. Um, and that's how, the, that's how I think we can get out of the, whatever context we have placed ourselves in. Um, and because then the students create that context of that classroom or, you know, the faculty and the students on that campus or administrators on the campus are creating their own context in that class on that campus's space. Um, and I think having voices is the way we do that um, and asking questions is the way we do that and taking the time to listen to the answer. And for me, um, I was looking at at the following the chat here and you know, again, that idea of walking on eggshells. And I think we have to not be afraid to ask questions. You know, I tell my students, I want you to ask questions. I want you to challenge me. I want you to challenge your other faculty and whatever it is you hear, because that's the only way you're going to learn. But I think we have to pause as professionals and remind ourselves to do that as well. Um, I become the lifelong learners that we're expecting our students to be. And because that's the only way as a collective education is going to continue to move forward is we have to continue to ask questions. And by asking those questions that removes our context or that reframes our context, whatever that context may be. Thank you for sharing, Ember. And thank you for uh, modifying the question from US context to context just generally. Um, that I think is uh, fantastic insight and, and perspective to, to view it in that lens. I want to end uh, one more question uh, with some takeaways uh, that you might be able to uh, uh, incorporate in your own um, digital creation and, and delivery and design. So Gabby, what are some low-hanging fruit faculty and staff and others can do to enhance the accessibility of the materials that they design and deliver? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is to be a digital ally, you know, being compassionate of our students and their needs, communicating often and clearly with them. Um, one of the biggest pieces that I know every faculty usually has this syllabus statement is sharing that syllabus statement and, and making it more inclusive and 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 um, accepting, you know, I think that sometimes those syllabus statements can be um, intimidating to students, um, personalizing this statement to be more inviting and encouraging students um, to identify, as Courtney said, you know, of all of their learning differences. You know, I, I think that's a great idea is, is asking students, how do they learn best um, so that you can 
tailor your course design um, to meet their needs. Um, being flexible about um, tool utilization and formats. This is a big piece. Um, when introducing new technologies, um, you know, trying not to overwhelm students. Picking one or two platforms um, or tools that will help you to deliver the class um, learning objectives. On, um, you know, and understanding that some third party tools and software may not be accessible and may present some barriers to students. Um, so at SUNY Delhi, we've, as part of our EIT plan, we've developed uh, a request process for obtaining and using third party technologies um, for instruction. And we've asked for these submissions to help determine if the tool is going to be accessible before it's used in the classroom. Um, I don't think that every campus has that, but that might be a suggestion for campuses to include in their process. Um, but at the very least, faculty should um, at least consider alternatives on a case by case basis if for some reason the tool or technology that you're using doesn't work for individual students. Um, students may be using assistive technologies that don't work with certain features of a technology tool. For example, um, there's been a lot of barriers uh, to proctoring software and, and the use of assistive technologies using proctoring software, video conferencing tools and polling software. Um, so with, you know, work with your campus EIT leaders and teams and disability services offices to help determine ways that students can engage and participate equitably, um, you know, while using the different tools that you want them to use. Other suggestions, um, you know, are have to do with time management. So everybody manages their time differently. Um, when possible, providing assignments in advance so that students can manage their time without the need for extensions. Um, this is especially useful for students with learning disabilities, mental health conditions, chronic health impairments. Um, we don't know when those symptoms will exasperate. And so um, we really encourage students to develop an aggressive time management schedule to assist them in staying on top of their assignments. But sometimes that's, it's inevitable, you know, that there are certain things that come up that will um, prevent them from being able to complete assignments on time. Um, and then be very explicit in your instructions and using plain language, clearly spelling out your expectations in your course. Um, the one last thing I wanted to talk about was it, with um, some just the digital, some additional digital accessibility uh, low hanging fruits, um, ensuring that your images have alt tags, your videos have accurate captions, you provide at least a transcript for your videos. If you can't, if you don't have time to provide captions, at least a transcript. Your document um, and course structure follow built-in heading styles. Uh, whenever possible, you use HTML content as opposed to PDF documents. Make sure you provide um, context for every link. Um, so the link must make sense in conjunction with what, what the heading is basically. Uh, making sure that the color that you use is not conveying meaning um, and using built in accessibility checkers uh, whenever possible to determine the barriers uh, uh, within your content. Thanks so much, Gabby. I, I just wanted to share that um, I reshared the presentation, which has a link to some resources that includes many points and practices uh, articulated throughout this panel uh, discussion today, such as some of the accessibility low hanging fruits and LGBTQ plus best practices and, and things like that. So please be sure to check out the last slide. And uh, with about 12 minutes left, I think it'd be great to open it up for question and answer. Um, you know, feel free to ask the questions in the chat, either, you know, generally to the panelists or to a specific panelist. You could also unmute yourself. I don't know if you're allowed to, but. Um, the recording. I'm going to add my uh, video to 
the chat as well, which is a was a short like five things you can do when you're ret returning when we were going to remote. So it wasn't necessarily about online learning, but if we're crash coursing remoting for students, because I mean, in some of our data that I also put in the resources in Nesli's PowerPoint, um, LGBT students were, are, were already disproportionately out online. So they have some abilities and uh, to get they've had connections and community and and I've been doing some of that emotional work there. But the there are now other things that are missing. Right. So we know about who has access uh, to earlier we were sharing some of that data but um lgbt communities communities of who are also black indigenous latinx inside of lgbt communities like that different tiered access and identity development um can be can also be overcome by by diversifying our examples even if we don't have communication with students we need to diversify our texts we need to diversify our books our images and our examples and we can do that through modeling and modeling is the biggest way that people learn um, and that so that they can become the future teachers uh, modeling those kinds of identities and experiences as well. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, we do have a question from the chat. Um, how do you balance flexibility with accountability? So if I could jump in and answer that, um, it takes research, right? And I'm just going to say, you know, we, we learn to join this community of scholarship, you can't assume that you're going to have the best practices in yourself. The reason why I've reached the point where I have in my career is because I'm always researching, researching best practices, attending workshops, going to trainings, modifying my practices in order to keep up to date with what's happening. Um, I shared it earlier, but I'm going to post it again. And somebody else mentioned this. SUNY has done a really great job of remote teaching clinics. There are a lot of resources. I think I gave six of them this summer, but I'm gonna share again the three that I think have been the most effective for people. I've done it across SUNY schools. And this, if you take a look at these three videos, I've actually compiled some of the resources that I've used over the years. So in it, you'll find a bunch of additional resources to help you learn practices. But to go back to that question about being flexible and, and mapping that balance is, you really have to take into consideration what your workload is too. So I'm just gonna use something interesting. You might all think this is crazy. Empire is a different model than most schools. I don't have a three, three, four, four load. I'm teaching 15 studies this semester. And the way in which I'm doing it is because we have independent studies as well as like traditional, what you would call courses. Now there's no possible way as a traditional professor that I could engage in a traditional framework of teaching with 15 studies. So what I've done is I record myself. Notice how I am, I'm excited. Guess what? I took acting classes. I took acting classes since I have been a professor in order to be a more engaging person on a screen so that I could do short videos that students would be like, oh, that's cool, she's a cool person. And then I would shoot these short videos and I would put them throughout my class because I knew I couldn't be there in person in 15 courses. I would also shoot videos that I could use across classes. So I will share in the chat box before we're done. I have an introduction video that you know t shows people what I want, what my expectations for the course. I don't mention what course it's for so that I can put it across all of my courses. It actually helps me to be in person, right? Because they can see me digitally without killing myself, trying to balance 15 courses in unimaginable ways. So this is the reason I say this. I didn't know these techniques before I came to Empire State College. I was a traditional professor, but I joined online open access communities. I listened to best practices from other professors and I adopted those skills to make it so that I could have some flexibility in my home life, but I could still be that effective teacher. And so I wanna say this because Courtney mentioned it earlier, it works. I won the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching, still, right, from doing all of this stuff, even teaching 15 classes. So I would say to all of you, you can do it. You can do it. And if you ever have questions, I'll put my email in the chat. I'm here to help. You know, I'd, I'd love for you to reach out to me. Uh, and the we did something you said early on is that teaching in the way that students are learning right that we are, we make these assumptions that young people or old people are are learning or cannot use technology differently or can use it but a lot of the education information that students are engaging or you know eating right now are short one minute two minute pointful meme connected back backed up with something that they can explore more 
themselves that makes learning fun and engaging and like a, a puzzle, which it, it is, instead of just telling them the answers and then giving them a test to tell us that they know the answer um, or write me about it, which I'm not gonna read. I'm just gonna look for the themes and tell you your spelling errors. But the teaching in this new environment and giving them that, that sound bite, that two minutes, I also break down my transcript after my video. And I also say where that information is at what timestamp. Right, so at 34, blah, 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 I say th this. If you're looking for that information, if you're following along in this reading, you can also see it there. Zoom gives you both of those things side by side in, in a way, but I also break that scaffolding down and then tell them to, to you know, that, um, what do you say, uh, you know, uh, redundancies to bring them back to the information. And it really comes down to universal design and designing it uh, once with the tweaks and the changes as we go and then uh, building from there. One thing I would just add is when it comes to flexibility versus accountability is how is the student actually participating? Um, you know, is it they're coming and asking for something because there's a barrier that they can't overcome on their own? And I see this a lot of times with my international students from certain populations where if it's digital content, there are censorship things happening that are beyond their control. So I can't expect them to do the assignment based on a response to an image or a video that they, they literally can't get. Um, so in that regard, they've advocated for themselves, they're explaining it, and it's a barrier that they can't overcome. So it's up to me then to work with them. Um, you know, if they're coming within a timely framework, it's something that they're participating in the process. Is it time consuming sometimes? Yes, but then, they're working, so I'm going to match them in that work. Um, the other thing is going back to the idea of universal design is also putting some of that onus on students in that we are in a digital world. They're pretty good at finding information and they're gonna find it in the way that they're going to respond to it. So making sure that the information I'm intentionally giving them is something that they can't find already in a text or a video or a meme. It's words that are gonna be meaningful enough to them where they're gonna take the time to listen because they know it's not something they could just turn off and go find in another regard. Um, I think that that's something that isn't important to remember when we are creating our courses and we're taking the time to type up or record videos for students. What is the information we're getting them and making sure that it is concise and to the point and important enough that we know they're gonna stop to, to take it in. Thank you, Ember. I, I don't think we had any more questions. If all of the panelists could, if they would like to put their emails in the chat and, and, and I will as well, that's something I uh, forgot to put on the slides. Um, but we have like four minutes left. So I was hoping, um, you know, you may offer some closing remarks or, uh, you know, I think Courtney had a really great comment in the in the chat, all these things, uh, you know, take time, troubleshoot, learn, research, attend all the workshops and things. And we have to think about ourselves as well and the, and the balance. Um, so I, I just want to throw that out there that, you know, be, be mindful. Um, so I'll stop talking and let y'all say uh, one or two last things before we end our panel today. Maybe you've said I think, everything. I think, <laughs> I think my final thing is, is we are a community of scholars, right? Everybody here today has joined this panel because we want to learn from each other and grow. So my hope would be don't let it stop here. You know, when we when you see these emails in the chat box, that genuinely means we want you to reach out to us because the only way truly that we can learn from each other is by continuing to engage with each other. You know, so please do continue to attend workshops across this this you know conference, but additional workshops because that's the way that we'll all learn. I really think that is the beauty of SUNY and being in a system like this is we can lean on each other and 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 really create those communities, whether it's on, on workspace or virtual happy hours or whatever you may do, attending conferences like this and connecting with each other offline. I, that really is the power of SUNY is the people that I've, I've met you all, almost all of you in person or seen you present online or something. And it's just, it's it's so amazing that we all get to be in each other's company and presence. 
And also, I'd like, you know, obviously, I think, I think, Nasley, for putting together this panel for all the work that you've done, um, one of the things where sh you're showcasing here is that our work is inextricably bound. Right. All of the things that we're doing, it's not just about, you know, my emotional health as an adjunct or a faculty member or a staff member or my pay or like whether I'm doing enough for the students and what they're going through in COVID. From an international uh, uh, politic and, and standpoint, um, the epidemic of, of racism and, and, and white supremacy, like though, if we're not able to to, to talk and connect and, and actualize ourselves and to create education more accessible and to think in new ways. Um, then we, then there are so many communities that are lost inside of there. And so all of that work is connected internationally, uh, globally. And so if we can get to that point, that universal design, that understanding, we realize that we're lifting together and we're lifting the weight um, for, a, for a larger portion of our communities. And we can get even farther down to connect with the people who we can't even see yet because they have not even been able to be visible for the needs that they have. So thank you for uh, bringing us together and I've had such a fabulous time. Thanks for the knowledge of this room. Yes, thank you all so much too for your time and wisdom. Uh, I appreciate each of you and everyone who attended today. And it is now 1030 and Kim said that this event is always available virtually, which is amazing. So if you came in at 10 o'clock and you missed the first hour, please watch it again or share it uh, with, with other folks. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Thank you, Nasli, and thanks to all of the panelists um, for a really excellent um, um, kickoff to day three of the